Good morning. Happy Sunday. I'm Kim Allen and I'm going to be with you today and we're going to be um, going a little further in the blessing of adversity. Um, live the blessed life. So before we get started, I'm just going to open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just come thanking you for today. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Lord. For those that are online listening in today, Lord, we ask that you would just bless everyone who has an ear to hear your word, Father. We pray that you continue to bless us, Lord. Open our ears and open our minds, Lord. Join us today, Lord. Lord, we know that you are the ultimate teacher. And so we just give you all the praise and all the glory. We love you. We adore you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And as I said, we're on, we're going to study Lesson 10, Part 1 today. And we're going to talk about live the blessed life. Not the best life, but the blessed life. And I believe there is a difference. So what is the blessed life? And I'm going to ask you these questions. I wish you were like right here with me so I could hear you answer back. But you're welcome to put some notes as you listen in. You're welcome to, to send the, the text, okay? So what is a blessed life? Is it possessions? Is it the square footage of your living space, your home, or your condo, or your apartment? Is that it? Is it the emblem on your car? Mm. Is it your wardrobe? Is it your job? Is it your financial worth? You know, those things that people so... You know, when they think that that is their best life or blessed life, they will come out with what their, what their financial status is. So I'm wondering what you put there. But I wanted to, we're going to talk about a blessed life in reference to how Jesus, what God would say that blessed life would be. Now, some men think that, a, like I said, the blessed life is... What I just read, fill in the blank. You could fill in that blank and put whatever it is that you feel it is. And I'm going to give you an example of, of a man in Matthew 7, 26 through 27, that thought living the blessed life was this, according to him. And I'm going to read the New International Version. I know some people will have looked at the um, King James Version, but it's it's pretty much the same. So this is Matthew 7, 26 through 27. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them to practice like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowd were amazed at his teaching. So he's saying, you know, build your house on a rock. Because if you build it on anything less, if you build it on sand, you know it's going gonna, it's gonna to sink. That sand's going to go away. So we have to know, we want to look to the word to find out what living the blessed life really is. And I'm going to go back. I'm going to read to you um, something that I thought really got to the heart of a blessed life. And this actually came from um, wordoftruth.org. Um, okay. It says, the blessed life is a life that is lived within the boundaries of the word. Where the spirit of the Lord is there, where, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. By contrast, a life lived in rebellion to his word always ends up meaningless, empty, unhappy, and yes, without God and without hope. And one thing you know, that if you um, live in those boundaries of the word, you know, you're, what are your chances that life is going to be blessed, it's going to be good, it's going to be the best life. And so we have to know that the word 
will give us instruction on how to live the blessed life. And at the reason I said it's not the best life, because some people really look at those worldly things as living the best life. But it could it could be a dangerous life. It could be a, a life of anxiety and worry and stress. So we're going to go through this lesson and just kind of read, read some scripture because that's the thing. We just really need to get into our word to find out what how to carve out our life, how to live the, the blessed life. And as you know that we've been studying the chapters out of um, the blessing of adversity. And so I would really wonder, um, how do you view the meaning of a blessed life? So just constantly ask yourself that. I'm going to read to you John 10 and 10. And just to put some light, more light on this. The thief cometh but not, but to steal and to kill and destroy. I come that you might have life and that they, they might have it more abundantly. And some, that, that's, that scripture is really something that you've heard probably over and over again. A lot of these scriptures, you know, there's been songs that have been made. I come that you might have life more abundantly. And that's what really God wants us. He wants us to live a blessed life. He wants to, He wants us to live our best life. And the only way we live our best life is if we live a blessed life. And so I'm going to keep driving that home because, like I said, some people think that it's something totally different than what it is. And so in, in the book, it talks about the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm, I'm going to back up a little bit because... That's what I read to you in this Matthew 7, 26 through 27. But there's another thing that I just could not skip over myself. When you look back to Matthew 5, it's the Beatitudes. And I'm going to pull some of those, pull that up so I can read this to you. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, um, take or sit in the company of mockers. And so in this lesson, we've got to figure out, you know, how do we not be in the presence of all this other stuff? You know, how do we make good choices not to be there, you know, with, you know, how do we ignore some of the stuff that we're subjected to in the world? And that's the thing, you know, sometimes when we're going to look for counsel or we, when we need counsel, We'll go to the very person that's going to give us the most worldly advice ever. So we're going to be talking about um, some of the people who did that and what the outcome were. So we want to get, you know, advice from wise counsel. We don't even want to be in the midst of these people who are, are going to uh, stir us the wrong way, point us in the wrong direction. You know, which could end up in disaster. I know that, you know, when I'm talking about this, you know somebody who has gotten some bad counsel. You know somebody who has went to someone and asked them something and they ended up in a world of trouble. So we want to avoid that. You know, as saints of God, as Christians, as believers, we don't want to be out there just doing anything. So we need to know what to ignore. And I'm going to read Psalms 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Did you hear that too, what I read in the Beatitudes? But in, the, in, lesson, in, in um, chapter 5 of Matthew, it's, you know, the Beatitudes. And it is exactly what it is, but it's funny how, doesn't that correlate with what I just read in the Beatitudes? So basically, it's telling you what should be your attitude. And so whatever advice you get, you need to know, does this line up with the Word of God? And if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, you need to let it go. As a matter of fact, don't even be in the presence of those people. 
as I said, who are telling you things that, you know, shouldn't be. So don't, don't walk with them, don't stand with them, and don't sit with them. So believers must be able to learn to ignore these encounters. And um, one of the, the stories we're going to talk about today that's in the Bible, and sometimes I know when you read the Bible, sometimes it might be a little, you know, intense, some of the wording. So one of the first things that we want to do is look at uh, a passage of scripture that we can understand. So, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a little bit. I'm going to tell you the story that we're going to go through, and I'm going to break it down. Because I know if I can understand it, I know you'll, you'll be able to understand it. Because I like it. Explain to me, you know, like a six-year-old. Explain it to me. Give it to me straight so that I don't have to think about it too much. This one is, this story is about David's son, Amnon, and he listened to counsel that really got him in trouble. Um, I, I will say that this is not my favorite story because, you know, he, he hurt someone, and we'll, we'll go on with that. So it came to pass, this is Second Samuel chapter 13, and we're going to be skipping around, so I'm going to just start it out, chapter 13, I'm going to start out with 1 through 4. But I'm going to kind of skip a little bit because to read this story would be a long, long story. But David's son, Amnon, listened to this counsel that was not good. And you're going to be able to tell right off that it's not good. And it came to pass after this um, that Absalom, son of David, the other son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it was hard for him to, to do anything with her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, and the son of Shemiah, David's brother. And so this Jonadab was a very subtle man. Now, when you hear a term like that, you know, I think of crafty, sneaky. And he said unto him, why are you, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase this, he said, why art thou? So why are you, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Will thou not tell me? And Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. So they're... They're both referred to as Tamar's brothers. You know, different mom, same dad. So Amnon lay down and made himself sick. So anyway, so the bottom line is this guy gives him some advice. And he basically says, you know, act like you're sick. You know, get her to come to you. Don't let anybody be around. And I'm paraphrasing. So Amnon lay down and made himself sick. And when the king was come to see him, Amnon said to the king, I pray thee, let Tamar, my sister, come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat at her hand. And so what did David do? He sent her. He sent her there. And so just to make a long story short, he, he raped Tamar. And that's, it wasn't her consent. She didn't want to do it. So you can't call it anything but what it was. And her brother Absalom, who loved his sister, saw the difference in her behavior. And, you know, of course he was upset. He asked his sister, um, here it is. Hath Amon thy brother been with thee? But hold now thy peace, my sister. He is thy brother. Regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. So it was devastating to Tamar. She was devastated. You know, uh, the whole thing in this, this day and age was to be a virgin, to be decorated, to be 
ready to acquire a husband. And, you know, she just could not even, she couldn't even talk to Am Amnon. She couldn't even talk to him. And so he did this deed. And basically, at the end of the story, he is, he is ultimately killed. Now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now, when Amnon's heart is mercy, is merry with wine. So he said, when he, when he gets full of wine, and when I say unto you, smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not. Have I commanded you? Be, be courageous. Be vigilant. Valiant. And the servant of Ab Absalom did unto Amnon as Absalom. Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's son rose, and every man got him up, got up on their mules, and they left. They fled. So basically, Absalom ordered his brother dead. He told him how to do it, get him drunk. And so this was his outcome. And why was this Amnon's outcome? Because he took some bad advice. He took he went to this council. He asked someone for counsel. First of all, we know that his heart wasn't right. We know that there was some other things that we don't even have time to call out. Lust and all that stuff. Because after that was done, he didn't want anything to do with her. Okay? So he took, some, he took counsel that caused him death. He listened to someone who had was just talking. And so that's what we have to avoid. Let's not do that. Let's not listen to people. So know when to ignore and what to ignore. Because people will give you all kinds of advice. And that's why the suggestion is that we read the word of God. We live within those boundaries. And that's how we go to the blessed life. We're going to also talk a little bit about um, Solomon's son, Rehoboam. Why do I always get the hard words? Um, you know, when you're reading to yourself, you don't think I've got to pronounce this. So, the, we're going to read a little bit of scripture. And this is 1 Kings 12 and 7. And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto the people this day, and will serve them, and answer them, and Speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. So this is when Solomon's son, he went to counsel. And he was giving, given two levels of counsel. So this was the age gave him wisdom. So this is the counsel he got when, when he took over, um, you know, Solomon's job. When, he, when Rehoboam took over. He was going, he wanted counsel on how to do that. How do I do this? And so he went and he got wise counsel. And then he went and he got some foolish counsel. And I'm going to read you 1 Kings 12, 10 through 11. Now that was 1 Kings 12, 7, with the age counsel that he was given with wisdom. So now we're going to read the foolish counsel. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak to the people that, sp that spake unto thee, saying, The Father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt, sorry, thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loin. And now, whereas my father did lay you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father's, my father hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So their advice to him was, you know, you got to be harder on these people. So think about the opposite of that. The first advice he got was to... Um, you know, that if you treat them well, they're going to serve you, right? They're going to be thy servants. And the second advice, they're like, you know, 
don't just give them the lips, give them the, the scorpion, you know, and these people are going to serve you. So what do you think is the best way? It's the, the wisdom that was given to him at first. And so when, when, he, when he got that wisdom, he should know by just the word of God what's right. I mean, you can even look at that. Probably somebody who is not in the word of God probably could look at that and see what was wrong. But that's not how the world is. The, if, you, if you look at what's going on in politics today, you can see some of that coming out. It's like people have kind of abandoned the word of God. Or they're not looking at their actions um, and how, how to govern people, how to lead, you know, how to live out a blessed life. So, you know, it comes back around. And so that's what this is really saying to us. And also, an example that we have is 1 Samuel 25, 30 through 31. And this, this council was giving, given from Abigail to David. And it was really good to counsel. So let's not think that we can only get counsel from men, because women have very good counsel too, right? So it's, it's an even playing field here on counsel. You can get counsel from men that's bad, and you can get counsel from women that's bad, you can get counsel from women that's good, and you can get counsel from men that's good. So I want to just stress that because I am a woman. So it came to pass when the Lord sh shall have done to my Lord according to the good that hath spoken concerning thee, and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel, that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto the Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with, with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. So basically, I know that was a lot of words there. And I know I, I'm just going to explain it a little different. She said, you know what? Just wait. Don't really do all this stuff. Um, because you are going to be blessed behind it. If you just hold your peace, you know, don't, don't cause any blood to be shed. You will be, be rewarded after this. And so the Lord is going to deal with him fairly. So it's, it's, it's one of those scriptures that, you know, I like to read in a different version, and I know I have it here. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on that. But we always want to look at what was said, um, what was the outcome. And so sometimes reading the scripture is really a little bit different when it's in a version that you can't read. And so that's why I said in the beginning, you got to really get a version of the word that you can read and understand it. Okay. All right. So I'm going to be switching a little bit. And we're going to read maybe some of the um, NIV. And David followed good, that good counsel of Abigail. And he was rewarded, right? afterward. And we're going to read, give one more example um, on how you just need to follow good advice. And I'm going to go back a little bit because I wanted to use another uh, example that was used in the book. And it really was about Samson and Delilah. And since I gave you some good advice that Abigail gave David, I'm going to give to you an example of when, um, you know, sometimes if you don't say no to sinners, if you think that people that come to you have your good, have always have good intention, that's not the case. And so that's our next number two, say no to sinners. Um, and I wanted to give an example of Samson and Delilah. 
because if you ever read the story of Samson and Delilah, I'm just going to paraphrase for a minute. It's a story about Samson. And, you know, for those of you who have read about Samson, Samson was a man of great strength. And everybody wondered, how is Samson so strong? He has this great strength. And Samson, you know, so Delilah, he, he, he hooks up with Delilah. And Delilah's a prostitute. And not only is Delilah a prostitute, but Delilah believes in, she wanted to take Samson down with some of the others. So her job was to really connect with Samson, find the secret to his strength, and then give it to the Philistines so that they could, they could eliminate Samson, right? So what, you know, so Samson and Delilah, I don't know what, what other way to say this, but they kind of hook up, right? So in this, you know, she's, he's kind of given her other reasons for his strength. He's not really given her the truth. And she goes back to him several times. And at the end, she's, she, you know, where it comes near to Samson's end, she's basically telling him, Oh, Samson, you, you're really basically making a fool out of me. I really need to know from you, what are you doing? What is it that gives you this strength? You know, how do you have this much strength to do what you do? And Samson really, at some point, you know, I don't know if he was, um, if he thought he could, you know, beat her at her own game. It almost seems like he knew what she was trying to do. And maybe he had to have a little too much wine. I don't know why, why he did it. But he really reveals to her his secret, which is this hair that he has. And he basically tells her how to do it. You know, if you basically pull my hair together, tie it up, and basically cut his hair off, you know, that's, that's his secret to his strength. And so that's what happens to Samson. It's basically the end of him because he gives her that secret. And what does she do? She's, she's a sinner. She's there to betray him. And she gives that secret to others. And most of you who have read this story knows that that is Samson's demise. Because after that, they do that. They capture him. They, they poke out his eyes because they felt like if he hadn't been, hadn't been looking, he wouldn't have got into the situation in the first place, right? So they basically... Um, they do him in after that. And so, was that his own fault? Mm -hmm. He didn't know how to say no to the sinners. He basically did all those things that we've talked about so far. He did it. And so, we'll give you, you know, we're, we want to give you some examples because you need to say no to sinners. Sometimes we can have the Samson syndrome, it says. We can overestimate our abilities to resist. And that, that goes really deep because some of us have some strongholds in our life before we got saved, right? You know, maybe it's drinking. I don't know. Maybe it's smoking. Maybe it's doing all those old things. Maybe it's going to the house party that you know you have no business going to. Whatever it is, you need to know that. And don't overestimate your ability to, to resist. Um, there have been people who have been in the Word, you know, Know what it takes to, to keep them there in God's will and God's way, in God's word, in God's boundaries. But they go back to what they did years ago, thinking, oh, I can resist this. Yep, I'm just going to go over here with all of them, all the people I used to, you know, smoke and drink and get high with and do all this stuff. I'm going to go in school with all these people. I know that they, that they do all these things, but I'm going to go over to their party tonight. And that's how people really get, you know, instead of saying no to that sin, they get in there thinking, oh, I, I've overcome that. And what happens? You see them fall right back into that trap. And, you know, there's people that want them to be there. They want them to be right in their sin because, you know what? You're not better. They're thinking in their mind, you're not better than us. And once you're here, we're going to see you do the same old thing that you did. And so what happens? That person goes right back. They're not comparing 
what's going on to the word of God at that time. And so that's why, you know, you don't sit with them, you don't do the things they do, and you don't stay there. You know, if you happen to go to a place, you know, in the word of God, he always gives you a way out. He gives you a way out, and you know what that way out is. So you get there, and the people are doing all those old things that you know that you have no business being there, then you take that way out. So don't don't even um, don't don't stay in the midst with sinners. Say no to the sinners. Um, so I'm going to read to you um, Paul's counsel to the church at Corinth. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. So basically, what he's saying is, so if you think you are all, you know, you're you are standing. Um, from them, you know, that you are upstanding, you, you've arrived from them, be careful. Be careful that you don't fall. And so it's just what I'm telling you. When you're in the midst of all that stuff, especially if you've experienced it before, and even if you haven't be experienced it before, you know, if you're a young person, and you know they all vape, and you know that's not a good thing, and you know they're not productive, they're not, that's not of God's word. That's not what you should be doing. Go the other way. Because if you don't want to be the one that falls just because your friends are doing it. So you always want to benchmark it to what, what am I, what should I be doing? What does God's word say I'm be doing? Are these people productive? You know, do they have good attitudes? Are they doing the right thing? You know what the answer is. And so, and then on C, it says maturity and discipline will help you overcome some of life's greatest challenges. Because I will say, saying no to sinners for some people can be a, a greatest challenge. Some people who haven't been there or refuse to, to try things that they haven't done that they know are, are ungodly, you know, they don't have the same risk as someone who, who's done it before. So, they can say, you know what, I know this is not the word of God. I know this is not what God has for me. Let me get up out of here, right? That's And that's what you should do. And then the last thing we're going to say in, in this lesson is live with reverence. And so living with reverence for God, that's what we're talking about. Um, Proverbs 1 through 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You know, there is, there is some people, it doesn't matter how hard you try with them or what you tell them. If they think it's the word of God, they're going to despise that. Why? Because they're already living that life. But you still got to give it to them because this might be their time that they're going to change their ways. And that's what, as saints and Christians, that's what we hope for. That the people around us, by hearing the word of God or seeing our walk, you know, definitely if somebody's in their element, it's, it might not be the time to, to start trying to preach to them. But you wait until you can get them in a different environment where they're listening to you and you can have a word. And you speak a word to them, a positive word, a word that God God would speak. And don't, you know, don't, don't get out your King James Version. You know, tell it to them like you would tell it to a six-year-old. Tell it to them like you would tell it to me. Because remember, I said, that's the way I like to hear it. Um, but if you have a reverence for God, and if you even read about the angels and their reverence for God, Isaiah 6, 3 says, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth is full of his glory. And I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a little nugget. I don't know if you come to second or you just always watch online, but I I sing in the choir and we are learning this song that starts out just like that. And it's I don't even wanna give it away because I'm sure that Dr. Bland, who's the minister of music, will be calling me and his assistant. Um, Ken Richardson, they'll be calling me saying, Kim, you gave this away. But 
this song is so powerful. And it's just like, you know, can't you hear the angels singing holy, 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 you know? And the song gives such a reverence for God that I think that on the Sunday we sing that song, it's going to break some yokes. It's going to restore some people. If you hear that God, that word of God, it, you know, the word of God does not come back void for one thing. But when you hear this song, it just speaks to my spirit. And, you know, I'm, I'm in my word. And, you know, but when I'm not in the word or when I'm somewhere else, or maybe I'm driving somewhere, you know, I put on my music. And I guarantee you this song is going to set the atmosphere. It will set the atmosphere in your car. It will set the atmosphere, you know, in the church. It will set the atmosphere when you are in, you know, a house full of sinners. And so, you know, have this reverence for God. And it talks about Moses, you know, at the burning bush and what a reverence that he had for God. And he said, and I'm going to, I'm going to read, I'm going to read this to you in another version because I, I, I've got to read it to you in another version. And hopefully I can go right to it. I have so much on my phone. And when I'm when I'm studying for something or I'm reading scripture, um, I I wanna I wanna just read more of it. I wanna see, you know, what was the reference re reference to that? You can't just read one part of the Bible and not read everything else that goes with it. And, okay, so this is Exodus 3, 5 through 6. And this is the New International Version. So this is an easier version for those of you who are really looking for a Bible that explains it a little bit um, um, simpler. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals. For this place is where you are stand for this place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. So just that point of um, reverence that Moses had for God, it was displayed there. When he met God at the burning bush. Because if you know that story, the burning bush just kept burning. And that's where God decided to, to really speak to, to Moses and really tell him who he was. So that Moses could deliver that to the people. And so the accountability is that once God really speaks to you, he wants you to speak it to someone else. And you know what? We have a whole world out there of people who are really waiting to hear God's word. And then another example in this lesson um, that was, you know, another example that was pulled out is the one where, you know, God heals the lepers, right? And he healed, it was 10 of them, right? He heals these lepers and only one comes back to really say thank you. And that leper was a Samaritan. So he really had a reference, reverence for God. So Luke 17, 12, and then 15 and 16. And as he entered a certain village there, he met the 10 lepers, which stood afar off. And one, and so after he had healed them, and one of them, this is 15, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, and with a loud voice glorified God, and he fell down on his face, at his feet, giving thanks, giving, giving him thanks, and he was the Samaritan. So, and if you, you know, read on in that story, you know, God basically says, well, well what happened to the nine, the other nine? And basically, they didn't even come back. But in verse 19, it says, And he said unto them, Arise, 
he's saying this unto the one that came back. So he says unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made you whole. Thy faith hath made thee whole. So, just about how we embrace our blessed life. You know, we need to be constantly telling God how thankful we are. When he does something for, for us, and I thought about that, you know, Kim, what, what is the one thing you're thankful for? And that's, that's a hard one because if I started telling you how thankful I was for the things God has done for me, it would take me all day. It would take me all day to tell you. And, you know, there's, you know, a lot of people said, if I had 10,000 tongues, I couldn't thank God enough. And that's so true. Because when you start counting your blessings, and, you know, you can even look and see what some of your friends have gone through. When you start counting your blessings, you know, take nothing for granted. Because it is the grace of God that you have been blessed to that point. So I really hope that you got something out of this lesson today. And if you just really tune, you know, if you're online and you just happen to go past this lesson and you're thinking, wow, I need to live the blessed life. Not the best life that I see it, but the blessed life as God sees you living. If you, if you have done that, you know, you need to really... Think about giving your life to God. Get in that word. Live by the boundaries of God. You know, that's where you start. Yeah, it doesn't happen overnight. When you, you know, confess Christ, does everything just fall into place overnight? It doesn't. But that's okay. Because we have another day. And we just start living our life from that point going forward. So if if I didn't if I didn't believe it and I didn't experience, I wouldn't be here talking to you. Because like like you, I've gone through some stuff in my life. But God is just He's He He's brought me through over the years. And every time I read His word, I don't care if I've read, read that scripture a hundred times, I get some new insight. So I hope your day is blessed. I hope you will join us at second. Baptist. Um, we just have a good time. You will meet some loving people who will just love upon you no matter where you are in your walk. So come on and join us at Second and you'll get more instruction. I'm not going to give you the address although I want to give you everything right now. You'll get that and it's going to be on your screen. So come on and join us. Um, we love the Word of God. We love God. And we want you to love them too. And we want you to receive the, the best life from God. So I thank you. I'm going to say a prayer out as we leave. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for giving the venue, Lord. I thank you for your word, Lord. Lord, I pray that this word came across clear to whoever it is that needed to hear it today, Father. Father, I just love you. I adore you. I love you for all the things you've done in my life and those, those around me, Lord. So I pray that you just enhance those lives of the people, Lord. Let that word sink into their hearts, Lord, that they might tell someone else. Lord, I give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.